It's rainy down in Bolivia right now. I talked to my wife this morning, and we were glad for the rain. Even though rainy days are not the nicest, but when you're low on water, rain is a tremendous blessing. Imagine when it hasn't rained for several months. Oh, the, the plants are thirsty, the trees are thirsty, and the people are thirsty. So we're grateful when we see rain. And then you get too much rain, and then you go, no, not another rainy day. But that's the way God gives us what we need. Okay, are we good with the audio now? Good. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I wasn't ex- ex- supposed to be here in the U.S. today. I came up to, to pick up an airplane and to take a load of mechanics down to South America, to Guyana, and to Brazil and work on the airplanes, get them all ready, and go back again, uh, take the, bring the plane back to the States, and then head back to Bolivia. When I got here, I discovered there was two issues, maintenance issues with the airplanes that were going to push it off about three weeks. And I didn't have a three-week window. I could have pushed it off any another several weeks beyond that. So I changed my ticket to go back down on Tuesday. And I'm just going to go up to Brazil from Bolivia, and the mechanics are flying down commercially. We'll meet in Brazil, and at least we'll take care of that aircraft. Um, and then on another trip, we'll try to catch Guyana. So uh, I was supposed to be overseas at this time, and I'm delighted to have a few extra days. It's always nice to, um, always nice to have a little extra time more than you hoped, even though there's still work to be done, but that didn't work out. So we took advantage, and I appreciate Pastor Ben making... Uh, this pulpit available so that we could share today some of the things that God is doing. Now, we live in very solemn times, like Pastor Ben said. We live in very solemn times. Um, I was reading this week in my devotions that as problems surround God's people, as, as difficulties, lack of comforts, and difficulties surround us, God's people will press together and put aside the little differences. Amen. And... And that will bring us together. Well, that's the only choice apparently God has. So let's not complain when things get difficult. That's God's means of pulling us together and focusing us on the mission. As long as things go well, it's like tomorrow will be just as nice as today and even better. But when things go difficult and we're seeing them around the world, complicating, difficult, death, hunger, strife, war, uh, uh, pestilences, are beginning to increase. The angels are pulling back, and what I'm going to share with you this morning uh, is going to is going to uh, uh, is going to focus us on on the, the the promises of God that He promises to be with us during these times because we're facing some serious times. I just got a call yesterday, uh, and how can I how can I encourage people to? I need dentists and doctors to come up and work in my ministry here in the U.S. And then they can get U.S. citizenship after five years and they can stay and live here. And I said, well, I can tell you how we can do that. But the question is, do you really want to bring them to this country? This country is about ready to explode. And you want to bring them here just as the explosion is about to happen. And then you tempt them thinking, well, you can get U.S. citizenship, but that's a process of two or three years, maybe longer. And... uh, is the, world, is the world going to be stable? Is the United States going to be stable for over the next seven or eight years? Things are happening around the world so fast, it makes you dizzy. And the angels are withdrawing. They're not going to release the winds completely until the work is done. But they're withdrawing. And as they withdraw, we find that uh, if we don't walk in the center of God's protection, there is no safety. And we're gonna, I'm going to mention what's happening in some places in the world and realize that truly... Truly, only God's protection can do it. I always, I always uh, like to kneel down for prayer before I begin so that it can be on the, on the video. And uh, as I kneel down here, if you want to just bow your heads or if you want to kneel with me, that's, that would be fine too. Heavenly Father, we do live in solemn times. We're watching these events happening in rapid order. We know the enemy knows he has but a short time and would like to destroy mankind. He would like to destroy God's people. But you have your hands over your people, and today we ask that this place will be circled with your holy angels and that the Holy Spirit will speak to each of our minds and hearts. Prepare us, encourage us, teach us to trust you more, 
and give us enthusiasm to do the will, to do the, to do the mission that, that has been uh, commended to us and that we can, uh, that we can uh, fulfill the reason for which you have placed us here in this place. Lord, today we focus on you now and we ask you all of these favors, not because we deserve it, but because of your promises and, uh, and it's your desire to pour out your spirit on us. And so we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't travel as much as I used to. There was 10 years that I traveled to nearly 50 countries a year. Almost every week I was in a different country, sleeping in a different bed, eating different food. And eventually I, started, I tried to slow down. It was hard to say no. But eventually it slowed down. And then the best thing that happened to us as far as rest was the pandemic. We couldn't fly anymore. We couldn't do other things. We just stayed at home. And I said, in 10 years, I haven't stayed at home more than two weeks. And suddenly now, two months, three months, four months, all that was wonderful. But I, I've come to the realization that even though I can't keep up the same pace, the truth is there's a lot of work to be done. And it does require sacrifice. And you say, well, travel is not sacrifice. Oh, I wish I could travel. Yeah, but it's like eating a, a favorite food every day, every day, every day, every day, pretty soon that food is not a favorite anymore. And if you travel, 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 finally you get allergic to, to traveling. So you travel three or four times a year. That's about, we still travel inside the country and we still go to neighboring countries, but to go to other countries and fly commercially, it wears you out a little bit and you don't have the energies before. But the work before us is greater than ever before. Uh, I was in Peru just uh, a few well, let me back up. I was in Peru, uh, one of our neighboring countries from Bolivia, about six or eight months ago. And uh, I lived in Peru 10 years before. And I worked as a mission pilot and I worked in the Union uh, for six years in Lima, 12 million people. And I drove every day from the university out in the country, back into town, back and forth for all these six years. And in Peru, everything happens fast. They talk fast, they work hard, they steal fast, they, any, anything they do, it's fast. So you have to be looking over your shoulder all the time. Well, after I left, I went to Peru, I signed the papers I had to sign, I went back to Bolivia on the same day. I just went by land. And it was about a 12-hour round trip. But I, I caught the bus, I went there, did the papers, came back again, and I got back into Bolivia and I go, Ah, it's a little slower pace here. I can relax. Well, I couldn't relax too because I didn't realize Peruvians were following me. <laughs> you go, Peruvians? Yeah, well, I got two Peruvian children. And, and I have five children. We adopted two Peruvians and one Mexican and two biological daughters. But who do you think was always fighting with each other? Our oldest Peruvian daughter and our youngest Peruvian baby. They were the two fighting all the time. And because their temperaments, it, 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 we're like, animals are bred. You know, a cat, a nice domestic cat runs around the house and sits on your shoulder. Try to get a jaguar to do that. I raised three little jaguars. And when I left, unfortunately, I was gone for several months. When I got back, they were dead. They didn't take care of them. They didn't know what to do. But the little jaguars had blue eyes, very cute little things. They were born right there on the step of a little village and they gave them to me. And I had to feed them and I had to put in G-tubes down their neck and down their nose and feed them that way until they got their energy up. But they left them out and they didn't feed them and eventually they were so little they died. But the jaguars, they don't run around the house and sit on your shoulders. But you say, but they never knew anything different. No, it's because they're, they're genes. They're bred to be wild cats. So if you ever remember the story of Little Tyke and, and you remember some of those others that uh, cats that grew up to be domesticated that were wild normally, but they didn't feed them any meat, no meat whatsoever. And, and uh, we're, we're, we have genes too. We were raised with a background, and some countries have certain types of genes, and other countries have other types of genes. And, and so I went to town, and, and I, I got in a, in a, in a normal uh, little minibus, which is what they transport passengers. I did not know it was a setup. And I went all the way in, into La Paz. And when I got there, one of the passengers who I made friends with said, 
I'm going to the airport too. Do you want to go in the same taxi? Yeah, let's go in the same taxi. Why pay twice? So I jumped in, I jumped in that taxi and just around the corner, a policeman was waiting on us and he stopped and he said, he whipped out his badge and he said, he jumped in the car and he says, we're suspecting drug traffic. I have to recheck all your bags. Okay, no problem. So he checked that one passenger and, and he had some money in his pocket and he handed him the money, he, okay? He gave it back to him, stuck in his pocket. Then he opened my bag and I always carry some cash with me and, uh, and he checked it and he put it back in the bag, I thought. And then he did, checked all my things and he put them back in the bag and then he says, you're okay, he called the police department, I thought. <laughs> it was all a setup. He wasn't a policeman and he didn't call the police department. In the end, he said, okay, you're okay. You can get down. So I got down with my bag, and they took off. And then I looked in my bag. All the money's missing. So he acted like he put it in, but he put it down somewhere else. Then I realized, ah, I just came from Peru, and they, they, fought, they came in the same bus with me all the way from Peru. They set it all up. So, so we went to Peru just two weeks ago, and I went with my wife and my son-in-law, and we had to go do some legal work. We went, came back, and we were very careful what vehicles we got into, make sure they were official vehicles. And one vehicle came up and said, we'll take you. We're, we're, doing, it. we're doing it cheaper than the other ones. I said, no, thank you. And, and I, we looked inside. Man, filled with wicked men. Man, you could see their eyes. This is a bunch of gangsters. We said, no, thank you. And they followed us. They kept following us. Come on, come on, come on. No, thank you. And we just walked, and I ignored them, and they kept following me along the road. And finally, we just got to the place where the official uh, buses left, and we got on an official bus, and we made it back safely, and everything went well. But just a week and a half ago, a, a young Peruvian lady and her daughters came to work with us and called my wife and said, we're coming by land, and we forgot to tell her, be careful, there's some kind of activities on the border. You need to be very careful. We didn't, we didn't tell her that. And she jumped into a regular taxi. And they got about an hour out. And this time it wasn't a policeman that said he was a policeman. It was a general. He said, I'm general so-and-so. I need to check you. And of course, if a general wants to check, go ahead and check. I mean, why? why? But a general, I mean, it's such a high ranking. So he, he checked all the bags. And, and then he said, she had her daughter there. And she said, I want you to go out and open up the bags in the back. So she got out the door, and as soon as she shut the door, the car took off with all our bags and her daughter. And she went, Lord, my daughter! And instantly, her daughter was next to her. And she goes, but I thought you were in the car. I was in the car. But why are you here? When did you get out? I didn't get out. And then she realized God had done a miracle. God pulled that young girl out of the car and instantly she was at the side of her mother. And then you realize what a wonderful thing it is to have a God. Imagine, it's one thing to lose your suitcases, your documents, and your money. It's something quite different to lose your daughter. And when you realize what's happening in the world with young people and children today, it's certain death. And, uh, and without becoming too descriptive, the world, the Holy Spirit's being withdrawn. In a little village where I used to fly in Peru, where the air base is, uh, it's a little tent village. It's near a big town, but the, there's been gangs of guys attacking young people on the road. Just if you're walking by yourself, suddenly, shoo, and they slice their throat, and they take out their lungs, their kidneys, and their liver, and they're gone. And you say, what? Well, during the, during the pandemic, there was plenty of dead COVID patients in that hospital in town. I got a picture there. They, they were, everybody who died, they took their organs. And, and since nobody's dying anymore, I guess we have to kill them now. And, and when you think of that's happening in some places, you think, when is that going to come here? It's just a matter of time. You think there's no wicked people that live around here? I mean, the world is filled with people that are not under the control of the Holy Spirit. And so if you think, if that's happening to young people, there's not a chance in the world that, that uh, it would bode well for a young lady that got abducted. So it encouraged me so much. I wanted to share it with you. 
If God can do that for her a week and a half ago, He'll do it for us. I'm glad I can pray for my children, my grandchildren. I'm glad that we can pray for those that we don't know where they are. Sometimes children go off and you don't know where they are. Their choice, many times. Or they abandon God or leave. But, but our hearts must be holding them up before the Lord at all times. We must walk in the light. You remember Pilgrim's Progress? The lions were right there trying to attack. And uh, the man of the house said, just walk in the lights. The lions are chained. If you stay in the light, the, the lions cannot hurt you. That's, what, that's really what it is today. We have to walk in a light. We do, not have, we do not have the liberties to walk outside of the light and expect the, uh, the lions not to touch us. So let us always walk in the light. Let us stay in the center of God's will, and God will, God will intervene on behalf of us and those that we pray for. Let us know that. Let us have that confidence that God hears prayers and God answers. The lady hardly had time to pray. She just said, my daughter, and there she was. But God heard her unheard prayer. And she was coming to serve as a missionary. And God protected them. So as we, as we uh, carry out the work that God has for us, let us remember always to, to stay in the center of God's will. And let us just pray for others and know that we have a God that hears. There are several chapters in the Bible that we are to memorize in times of difficulties or we should have memorized for times of difficulty. Do you remember what some of them are? Psalms 91. Psalms 91 is one of them. Psalms 23. Psalms, 23. Psalms 46. Th those Why Psalms? Well, they're beautiful promises of God's care. You know, God is our refuge and strength. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He that dwelleth under the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Those are promises that will hold us during those times of difficulty. And none of us like difficulties, but it cannot be avoided. And therefore, if we hold on to God, our strength and, and our confidence in Him will grow. It will grow, and we'll we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to have the confidence to help others and share with others as well. I was in the Philippines uh, some years ago, and uh, one of the ladies that we stayed with at their house and her son is our media director. She, she told me about her mother in the Second World War. Her mother used to work with the, what should we call it, the resistance. When the Japanese took over all the Philippine Islands, there was still an underground resistance. There's, there always is in, in, every, in every country, in France, in Germany, and others, there's always an underground that, that works against the, the, the government that takes over the country. And so her job, her job was to uh, make sure that everybody got paid. So she would receive the money and she would travel to the different areas where people were, the underground was working and she would drop off the funds. But you can imagine that's very risky. And, and one day she was caught. And uh, she suffered torture and she suffered... Uh, harassment and she suffered prison terms and eventually she was released. But after the war, after the war, she visited her Japanese captors and some of them stayed in the Philippines, others returned back to Japan, but she was, she was influential and in bringing several of them to Christ. And I said, we always notice something different about you. You know, even, even as a prisoner, you were always praying for us. You were always treating us nicely and we were hurting you and yet you always treated us nicely and they said, we want to know what kind of God you believe in. So she was able to share with them and, and uh, uh, the daughter recently passed away, the, uh, the elderly lady whose mother was the, this person. But, but they, took me, they took me to a place where they used to execute prisoners and showed me this is where many of my friends died. And... Uh, and it reminds me of Norway up there. A pastor, a friend of mine and I were driving down the road and he, the, the pastor's father is also a pastor, a retired pastor. And as they were dri we were driving along the road, he said, I always hate this part of the road. I said, why? It's beautiful here in Norway because under this road are buried a lot of my friends. 
when the Nazis took over. Uh, the pastors were put into slave labor and many of them were just executed and just put under the road and the tractors would cover them up and the pavement would go over the top. So he said, I hate this part of the road. You can understand. So um, these mysteries that sometimes we don't know why. God doesn't always answer our whys. Um, but he will in heaven. And what appears difficult situations will have perfect harmony, we are told. Eventually, uh, God will explain those difficult times of our life when we say, but I don't understand why. Someday we will know why. And we will see that God allowed certain things for our own good. Uh, uh, some years ago, I was, in a, I was in a town in Bolivia as I was getting ready to fly to Brazil with my wife. The, the director of civil aviation came over to talk to me and, uh, for that town. Uh, and and I, I said, I said, Jorge, I heard something. He said, what? I heard that you're running around on your wife. He said, yeah. He's not an Adventist. His mother is an Adventist. But uh, I said, I heard that you're running around on your wife. And he said, I, yes, I did. And I said, you know, that's a sin against your own body. It's a sin against God. And it's a sin against your own wife. I know. Would you like to terminate that relationship and ask God to forgive you? Yes, I would. So we went around the side of the building and I led him in a prayer of confession. And he confessed the sins. And then I said, now go tell your wife this evening, go tell your wife that you're sorry and ask her forgiveness as well. And then tell the young lady you're sorry and ask her forgiveness. He said, okay, but first I have a flight to make. I said, well, you go on your flight. I, my flight is international. I'm going to Brazil, so I'll see you later. My wife and I took off. We, we left. It. He jumped in his airplane, and he went to a little, a little uh, village. Welcome. He went to a little village, and not a village, uh, more a ranch. And when he was there, some men pulled out a, a gun, hijacked him. They tied him up. They put him in the back of the airplane. And another pilot jumped into his airplane. And as he was taking off, the people who were on the ground said, just as the plane lifted off, they saw him in the back to the window jump from the back and hit the pilot on the head. Of course, the pilot slumped forward against the controls. And then immediately the plane took a nosedive and went straight into the ground. And everybody was killed. When I found out about it about several weeks later, I said, you know what? I bet it's the first time in his life that he ever confessed his sins. And God looked into the future and said, it'll probably be the last time that he's right with God. Let me take him right now. Well, I never talked to his family. Several years went by and I was preaching in one of the largest churches in another part of Bolivia. And, and I told that story. And I'm in a pulpit, and it's a big church, 500 members, and I'm up there. And some lady comes walking along, crying. And what do you do as a pastor? And this lady walks up to the pulpit and throws her arms around me. I don't know who she is. But she kept crying and crying, and I'm sitting going. And this lady is holding onto my neck and crying. And finally, she said, I am her, his wife. He never got home that day. He died and he never told me. He never got a chance to talk to me and I did not know that he'd made things right with God. I am so thankful that Pastor Gates talked to him and led him to the Lord and I'm thankful that God took him while he was right with the Lord. So I'm looking forward to seeing him in the resurrection. Now, every time we share with somebody else or just lead them, God, God sometimes uh, has a job for them to do like like Saul, or sometimes he just wants to save them. I was standing about six months ago uh, in, up in a mountain village town in, in Bolivia, and I was talking to one of the nurses, and just then a motorcycle shot back me, shot by me from the back, and went out into the road just as a big tractor trailer ran across him. With motorcycle and everything under the... Anyway, when, when it was over, the truck stopped, the motorcycle was over there, 
and there he was in the middle of the road, cut in half. But there was no blood. So it, it cut his abdomen, his legs were sitting off to the side, upside down, and he was there. And as a nurse, we know that the last thing that you lose is your hearing. Even if you can't talk, even if you can't say anything or open your eyes, you can still hear. It's the last sense to lose. So, so I immediately went to his side, felt his pulse, and he had a good carotid pulse. Well, if he has a good carotid pulse, his brain is getting blood, right? So I started talking to him, and I said, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I know you can't talk to me. You've had a terrible accident. You're cut in half, and you're going to die soon. But I, I saw the whole thing, and I believe God is trying to save you. You've probably lived a life without God, but I know you don't want to die and l die for eternity. Do you want to be saved? Do you, do you want in your heart to see God and go to heaven? And his body went like that. He moved his body. So I said, are you hearing me? Move your body. He moved his body. So I said, okay, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. And I repeated it several times in case his consciousness was slow. And, and I said, confess. he confessed his sins. And, and he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and said, forgive me for my past life. I want to be saved. I want to live forever with you. And, and I ask you, please, thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I let him that. And, and, uh, and then later, later, the ambulance came. We put his body in, and a few minutes later, he was dead. I told him, I'm going to look up your family. I'm going to tell your family. I don't know what your name is. His name was Christian. But I, I said, I'm going to look up your family, and I will talk to them and ask them to accept Christ as well. And he shook his head. Five times, he shook his body. And then he was gone. And I thought, how merciful of God we serve that will snatch us right out from under the devil. The devil said, I got another one, not this one. Isn't that, isn't that a marvelous Savior? Now, for those of us that have given our heart to him, imagine how, how loving God is with us when we give him permission, when we pray, when we ask. So, so today's sermon is an encouragement sermon. This first sermon today is an encouragement sermon to help us to realize that we have such a loving God that he will do anything necessary to save us unless we overtly reject now we can be we can get caught up with the cares of this world we can love the world we can be careless and indifferent those that are careless and indifferent in their process of salvation the angels leave them in perfect darkness so we don't want to be careless what is carelessness it's when you you put other priorities first over the most important, right? Isn't that carelessness? When something is important, but you really don't care that much. It's carelessness and, and indifferent. Well, I'm going to church. My parents were church members. My grandparents knew, knew the Lord. I'm living my young life, and I can do whatever I want to. Someday, when I get older, then I'll, I'll pay more attention. That's, that is indifference and carelessness. And so those that are indifferent and careless at this very time in history will find that the light will disappear. The light will go, and they won't be able to have the guidance. Now, I, my wife and I landed in Puerto Rico. Uh, my wife and I landed in Puerto Rico uh, some years ago. And in the Spanish world, and among Hispanics, probably other cultures too, but not so much in the U.S., if your brother marries a family... Uh, in, a, in, the, in the normal American culture, if your brother marries into somebody, that's his in-laws, right? Right? That's his family. But it's not yours. It's his family. It's his in-laws. But not in, not in the Spanish. When my brother marries into a family, all of her family is my family too. So she, my brother married a Puerto Rican girl. So all of her family in Puerto Rico suddenly becomes my family. Right? So it's an extended family. So when I get to Puerto Rico, I say, Oh, tío, tía, uncle and aunt, how are you doing? Why? Because, because that's his wife's uncle and aunt. So it's my uncle and aunt too. <laughs> kind of nice, isn't it? I'm, I'm sure other cultures are probably that way, maybe, maybe in other countries. But that's 
I, I haven't lived in all those countries, but I realize that just the way we do it is not the way everybody does it. So, so I, we, I, uncle, the, her uncle picked us up. Hi, Theo, how are you doing? And uh, he took us to his house to sleep and he said, David, I have a question. I've been conference president for nearly, nearly 10 years. I've, I was a conference president. I just retired. But I have a, I have a, a question. Since I retired in 2015, you can't believe the type of problems our pastors are wrestling with. We have more pastors committing adultery, more pastors involved in pornography, more pastors stealing tithing, more pastors... What? I never dealt with those kind of things. What is happening? I said, Theo, I can only tell you what I believe. I, I can't prove it. I believe that the Holy Spirit's being withdrawn from those leaders that know better and choose to live in sin. And once the Holy Spirit's being withdrawn, you have no conscience. And if you have nothing to tell you it's wrong, you're seeing stealing, adultery, pornography, other problems in the church, moral issues, and you say, well, why? Well, if there's no Holy Spirit to tell you anything, you don't see anything wrong with it. You just get up and say, hey, I think I can get some extra money here. Or I'll just do what everybody... I went to a pastor's house one time and the wall was solid with hundreds and hundreds of all the latest videos. And I said, how come you have all of those latest... Oh, he said, I've watched every one of them. I watch them over again. But how can you fill your mind with all of that and still have the Holy Spirit speak to you? Oh, but, but those are my favorites. It's, my question still stands. How can you fill your mind with so much of the world and still expect to convey a spiritual message? You have to fill your mind with God's things. So, since we're living at the end of time, it's very, very important that God's people fill their mind and keep their eyes on Jesus. Because my sermons are practical. They're not theoretical. So I tell you a lot of stories. Because, because it has to lead you to practical Christian behavior. And it... And the stories help even children to understand. And, and so we have to live Christian lives, but it's not a theoretical thing. We actually have to live them. And we actually have to be Christ-like. But we can't make ourselves Christ-like. So how do I do it? By beholding, we become changed. Amen. As you behold Christ, you become Christ-like. As you behold the world, you become worldly. And th- we have to choose. Is it important for me to be Christ-like? Well, you know what? If you take your eyes off of Christ and you become careless and indifferent, the angels leave you in perfect darkness. And pretty soon everything seems right to you. What's the problem with this? What's the problem with that? I was in in Brazil and three union presidents that year, a few years ago, resigned. Three union presidents resigned? And just a few months ago, one union president in Peru resigned. All of them moral issues without going into details. Some of them were very, pretty low morals, not just an adulterous relationship, sometimes a little worse than that. But you say, but how's that possible in a leader? No, it's just that if you consistently violate your conscience, the Holy Spirit is saying, we don't have time to play games anymore. Either you grow closer to God or he withdraws and you can do anything you want to. And... We are at the point, did you know that the door will close for the Seventh-day Adventist Church before it closes for the world in general? You know that. God's people, the ten virgins, will come to a crisis before the rest of the world. They have to come to a crisis and be separated before they can receive the Holy Spirit and before the loud cry can go forward. And it's a painful process. Sister White says it's a painful process, but it must happen. And a storm is usually persecution. Persecution. And you look at the future and you say, what are the chances that there'll be persecution in Benton, in Tennessee? What? No, there's not going to be persecution. If not for a long time. Well, everything is in place. The storm is ready to hit, but it's hidden. Uh, in last day events, it says Satan has a thousand batteries. What's a battery? A cannon, a battering ram, a thousand weapons aimed at God's people. Hidden batteries, waiting the opportunity. You don't think there's laws already in place that will deal with Seventh Avenue? 
You don't think there's laws in place already set up, just waiting the opportunity to execute? There is. So we, we live in this little... The, uh, what, about, what about traps for animals that people put in the, in the different places? There's bird traps, there's tiger traps, there is fish traps, there is lobster traps, all kinds of traps. And, and usually you want to kind of hide it. Even fish line is made transparent, so when the fish line is in the water, it's not a little black string, it's not a little white string where the fish can see what's happening. You have to deceive the animal into thinking everything is safe. Well, ask most Seventh-day Adventists today if it's safe today. And most will tell you, things are pretty normal. In fact, I was driving down the road the other day, and I went by the academy, went by the college, the university, and I thought, wow, I could almost imagine... It was 40 years ago, and I was walking up and down these halls. I can imagine summer's almost over and school's about ready to begin. I can almost imagine it's a normal day here in Collegedale. Could you sometimes imagine that? I can do anything I want to. I can go to the store, I can buy, I can sell, I can go to the bank, I can do things. And you have no idea the traps that are set. A thousand hidden batteries, hidden, ready for God's people. But it happens all of a sudden. So when I was getting into that taxi in, in La Paz, Bolivia, and we see a policeman there, I was totally caught by surprise. Well, if a policeman wants to check my bags, it's not a problem. But he wasn't a policeman. He was a thief. He said he was a policeman, but it caught me by surprise, and he got my money. So next time, I was very much more alert and making sure. I said, what, what's going on here? And then I realized it's these private vehicles trying to get tourists and passengers to get on board thinking it's normal transportation but what they really have is an intention to take you off in a different direction and get you to expose everything you have be it a general, be it a police, be it whatever. So God is leading his people today closer and closer to his will and if you resist and you say no, 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 no what happens is eventually he says okay, you can do what you want to. I remember my little my youngest brother, he's not little anymore, but um, uh, both my two brothers, I'm the oldest, then I have, an, a two, uh, they have one brother, a sister, and a brother. Well, my two brothers took medicine at Loma Linda. And my, my youngest brother, my, my parents told me they wanted me to take medicine too. And my wife, her aunt said, I'll pay for you to go to medicine, take medicine. So we started pre-med. We took nursing first and we started it. And so one day we, I was looking and I said, is this taking us where we want to go? What do you mean? We want to be mission pilots. My wife's a pilot. My wife's a nurse, and I am too. I said, we want to fly as mission pilots. Does medicine really take us there? Because doctors are so busy most of the time, they don't have time to go to the mission field and, and do mission flying and to be a pilot. Pilots have to be proficient. It is a whole profession all by itself. So I said, this is going to take us, and we decided No. So we withdrew from pre-med, finished up some other studies, and we continued on with our mission service. And, uh, and, and my, my daughter, she wanted to take dentistry, and my son-in-law wanted to take medicine. And I told him, why don't you take nursing, become a nurse practitioner instead of a physician? You can still practice medicine. And you can take dental hygiene and nursing. You can be a nurse and a dental hygienist. And you can do everything you need to, but the mission field needs people to run health programs. Doctors don't have time. Somebody else needs to run it. So they did it. They did exactly that. And they went to Brazil and they worked for years and now they went to, they went to Egypt to work. And they're using their skills for that, to run programs where other people can come and work. But my little brother was halfway through medicine and we always teased him a lot. You know, you tease little brother, he's 10 years younger than me. And what do you know? And one day my brother and I were working outside and he looked up and he said, you have hairs on your chest. You know how when you're a teenager, you start getting a little few hairs? <laughs> and now the, he goes, you got hairs on your chest. And I said, well, you have hairs on your back. I have hairs on my back? And I got a piece of coal and I drew a, yeah, the cross hairs. <laughs> we used to tease the little brothers. Anyway, he, he would say, I'm smarter than you are. You're not smarter than anybody. We used to just tease him. Well, he turned out to be pretty smart because he made the record for all the exams in La Melinda. I mean, it's, it's hard to go to Loma Linda and make the record. 
but he made the highest scores on his two-year exam and his four-year exam, but he got proud. He got proud, and he started doing things that his professors allowed him to do, but that was against school rules because he was capable, and he was smart, and he could, so he did it. And then they caught him, and instead of saying, I'm sorry, I disobeyed the rules, what did he do? He says, but I'm capable. I can. Oh, really? Well, you're out of school here. They, 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 they threw him out of school. Out of Loma Linda in his last year. Now he was angry. God, I don't understand. I don't. Instead of humbling himself, he, he was angry at God for throwing him out of Loma Linda. So, so he was driving along and he said, I can go to any school I want to. With the, with the problems, I can go to any school. And God said, do you want to do what you want to do or do you want to do what I want you to do? And he said, what do you want me to do? He said, write to your brother David. He's ADRA director down in Guyana. Go help him for a year in Guyana. So he said, what? Go to South America instead of finishing medical school. That's what I want you to do. Now you can do whatever you want to, but if you do, I won't bother you again. But if you do what I want you to do, I will help fix everything. Thank the Lord that he called me and he said, David, can I come and help you for a year? So he explained the problem and I said, sure. So he came down. The first thing he did was paint the hospital. The hospital needed a painting and he, he said, I know how to paint. So he, he bought a paint stripper and he stripped the whole hospital down with high pressure water and then he painted the whole hospital. And while he's up there painting, little did he know that God had arranged something. It was time for a, a review of the hospital by the general conference. So the General Conference brought all the hospital, all the university presidents and hospital administrators from around the Americas, Loma Linda included, and they all went down to Guyana to do a review of the little Adventist hospital. And while they're there, they told the administrator, Bertie, this is looking nice. You're painting the hospital. Yeah, we had a volunteer come down. He's painting it right now on the... Very nice. This is very good. Well, we didn't have the money to do it, but he came down and he's raised the money and he's painting the hospital. Really, let us, let us tell him thank you. So they went over there and he has his big old mask on when he's painting the hospital. And, and then he stops. He pulls off. Why? Dr. Hart, how are you doing? <laughs> is that you, Don? Why, we just threw you out of medical school. Yes, what are you doing here? I'm a volunteer. I'm working with my brother, a NADRA volunteer, for a year. You, the bright physician who always is so arrogant, I mean, not physician, but medical student, so arrogant, you're down here serving for a year? I think we made a mistake. Would you like to come back next year? I would love it. Accept it. Now, I still pray for him a lot because he's taken off in a different direction. But God can do the same thing for him that he did before as long as we keep praying. But the main thing is God told him something. If you want to do what you want to do, I won't bother you anymore. That's a dangerous statement. Do you want to be bothered by God? Do you want God to talk to you and tell you to the left? You want your ear to hear the words saying, this is a way walk ye in it when you turn to the left or when you turn to the right. Amen. We want to hear that. But to do that, we have to be obedient. We have to be willing to be obedient. We may fall. We might make mistakes. But the loving God that we serve is so willing to guide us if we just let him. So when God promises us that he will never leave us or forsake us, that's exactly what he meant. And that's the same. What he told Joshua applies to us too. That do not be dismayed. Do not be discouraged. Just do what I do not deviate to the left or to the right from all that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And then it will go well with you. So this morning, depression, disease surround us everywhere. Death surrounds us everywhere. Disasters, the fires in Hawaii. I wish we could say they were accidental fires. But that would be lying. And paradise, fires. My wife's, my wife's two uncles and aunts lived in paradise when those fires started. And you know how God did for them? 
He told them the day before, go buy gas in your car and go fill your car with all your things. Why? Because I told you to. So they went and filled up their tank with gas and filled all their car full of things. At 6 in the morning, they knocked on the door and said, you have 15 minutes to be out of town. They just got in their car and they drove. And there was fire everywhere as the, as the fires were burning. The trees didn't burn, but the houses did. It was supposed to be a forest fire, right? It was supposed to be. All the cars melted. Uh, all the refrigerators burned to the ground. All the metal completely destroyed. But the trees and the plastic toys on the front yard were still there. So you know that it was uh, extremely hot heat in that very same position. But the trees ne right next to it, 20 feet away, didn't get touched. In any case, we are seeing these man-made disasters happening around the world. Satan is angry. But you know what? God took care of my wife's family and they were ready to leave. God prepared them ahead. In time of war, in time of disaster, in time of grief, God is taking care of you. That's why it was nice to sing number 99 this morning, God will take care of you. What a lovely song that is. To have that ringing in your ears, God will take care of you. We need to walk in his presence all the time. We need to have that certainty of his protection. Uh, I, I was traveling back in Peru from our, the North Peru mission. I was traveling back to the Union and I got back to Lima in the bus. And I had to, I had to uh, go to the bathroom. But I said, I can, I can last. My bladder can last another 10 minutes. I'll be, at the, I'll be at the terminal and I'll get off and use the bathroom. Well, lo and behold, the bus said, there's a blockade. There's a block in the road, so we're not going to make it to the terminal. Everybody get off right here. What? Out in the middle of the street? But that's what we had to do. And I said, now I'm in trouble. Where do I go to the bathroom? And I had my, I was in my suit, just like this, you know. I'm, if you work for the union, you dress in suits. <laughs> and, and you have a nice office, and you work, and you do the work. Anyway, so I'm in a suit. I'm going, but this is kind of strange to be out in the street among street people and gangs and other people, and you're dressed in a suit like this, it's like honey to flies. Hey, there's a guy we can assault, you know. So I said, what do I do? Normally I should catch a taxi and go, but I can't last 10 more minutes. So I said, I looked down around, I saw way at the far end of a little alley, I saw it said, baño, bathroom. So I said, I'm going to walk there. I took my briefcase, my computer, and I walked down there. And I, I was very, really aware that a bunch of eyes were following me. Like, when does a guy like this walk down a little narrow alley in a bad part of town? But I had no choice. So I walked down, and I gave the guy the coin that he asked for, and I got into the bathroom. Well, I just parked myself in front of the urinal when I heard a scuffle at the door. I looked up, and a gang member came in with a big sword this big. He had a red bandana on his head and he came running toward me to run me through with it. And I was helpless. What, what, how can you be? I wasn't, I wasn't waiting like this. <laughs> you know, no, I don't know karate. But anyway, I wasn't, I wasn't in a defensive maneuver at all. I was in a very indefensive maneuver. And, and, so, and so I just looked at him and he, he came at me with a sword and then he happened to look up. He looked up about... I would guess about 15 feet. He put the sword down and he stepped away from, the, from me and he went to the corner and he stuck his head in the corner like a little punished kid and that's where, that's where he stayed. And, and I finished up rapidly and I was out. As soon as I left, the guy at the door, he didn't expect me to come out. He expected the other guy to come out with my briefcase. But I came out like normal. And the guy was going, he's looking at me like staring. And I looked up, what is the guy looking at? He was going like this. And I didn't see anything. But I know he saw something that he saw what I couldn't see. A big angel, a lot bigger than him. Probably going like this.
and he obeyed. He put his head down and went, put it in, stood in the corner. Another pastor friend of mine went to see a young lady from the university. She had got baptized. She came to university. Unfortunately, she got pregnant. The, the non-Adventist father was extremely furious and said, I'm going to kill that pastor. And he told all his friends, My pastor, the pastor is coming today and I'm going to kill him. Here's a machete. It's all sharp. And all the neighbors, instead of helping and calling the police, they all wanted to watch. So they were watching to see the killing. But when the pastor came to the door, he had his machete behind his back, but he kept looking at the little VW bug and looking at the pastor and looking at the bug and looking at the pastor. And, and all the neighbors were watching, well, when is it going to begin? When is he going to chop the pastor up? And he never did. He told the pastor, come tomorrow. So he came tomorrow. Then he didn't have the machete then, but he said, tell me something. Who was that big muscle man that you had standing by your car? He had big arms like this. He, and he had his arms on top of the VW bug and he was watching me. And I thought, man, I better not pull that machete out. That guy's going to tear me apart in pieces. I didn't have anybody with me. But he was sitting there watching me the whole time. That was my angel. You know, we hear stories like this, but it doesn't just happen to others. It happens to us. How many of us today could say, how many of us could say today that you know you're alive today because God saved you from certain death? Can I see your hands? Look at that. That's about 70%. Maybe. We don't know sometimes. We don't know, but we, we surmise. My aunt was driving a car in Nashville, and she looked in the mirror, and a, and a car is flying right over her car, right over her trunk, in the air. He goes, what? And evidently, he came off a bridge, flying through the air, and went right over the back of the, her car and landed and crashed right there. But she just looked in the mirror and saw a car flying by. One second before, it would have hit her right in. We don't understand, but we do know that God intervenes. And in the future, we're going to need that protection. Amen. We're going to need to walk every day, every morning, turn our life over, and keep praying for your loved ones that aren't committed yet. Don't give up for a second. Why? Because God has a plan for them. My mother died a couple of years ago in Bolivia. She came to Bolivia. She was already deteriorating with Parkinson's. And she got worse and worse and worse. And she had so much pain. I thought, that doesn't... She was always... Ah, ah, so much pain. And I thought, my poor mom, she just... She's not her normal self. Because when you're in pain a lot, you can... It's hard. But she died. And we took her up to the mountains. We got her birth death certificate. And we took her up to the mountains and buried her there. Right across from the house. Facing east. So when she gets up... She's looking east. and uh, But I asked my dad. I was up in the mountains when she died. He said her pulse stopped. She stopped breathing and her pulse at 6 a.m. But she remained. She remained. Uh, what, what is the word? Not conscious, but she was smiling and moving for another hour. It's like the Lord was giving her a vision of all her work and all the years as missionaries, all the souls that were going to be saved. Her children, God had promised her he was going to save her children. And there's two of them that are, that are far, kind of far away from the Lord right now. But she was just smiling. It's like God just gave her a panorama for a whole hour, not breathing, no pulse, and yet warm and rea reacting. And then finally, that was it. And she slept. I don't know why God showed her, but you know what? God loves the death of his saints because he's, he's uh, always close to them. Uh, you ever heard, have you, many of you have heard of Josephine Cunnington Edwards? Yeah. Those of us in the older generation, we remember her stories. She came and stayed at her house one time here in Appleton. One camp meeting, they invited her, but nobody made any arrangements for her to stay. So my parents invited her home. She told us a wonderful story. She said she knew she had a friend called John, if I remember the name correctly. And, and John's parents were very, very consecrated. But they died, and John was a smoker and a drinker. And they died believing they would never see their son again. 
and John continued living a worldly life without God. But one day he was watching TV there at a door. Somebody knocked at the door and came in, and it was Jesus. He came in and he sat down right next to John, put his, put his hands right on his knee. He said, John, your parents are dear saints of mine. And they passed away believing they would never see you again. But John, <laughs> resurrection morning's coming very soon. And I want a surprise for them. They died they, thinking they would never see you again. But John, I want you to be there to welcome them. Would you give your heart to me? And John just poured his heart out. He knelt down at, at Jesus' feet and just cried and cried and gave his heart to And when he opened his eyes, he wasn't there anymore. But John lived a consecrated Christian life the rest of his life with his heart belonging to the Lord. I think Jesus loves surprises. I'm I'm going going, um, to Bolivia on Tuesday and I got a surprise for my wife. She doesn't know what I bought for her. She never buys anything for herself. I'm I'm the one that buys things for her. So I didn't tell her, I'm going to bring a surprise. And then my granddaughter calls and says, uh, he, they call me uh, Pabai. That's an Indian name for a grandfather uh, from Guyana. Pabai, yes, I have, I, could you bring me something? I said, I already know what you want. You know what I want? Yeah. You want a couple of books of Berenstein Bears. You know those little tiny booklets for children? Sometimes they have good ones and sometimes the other stuff but you pick the good ones out but there's hundreds of them that they've written so I go to the Kate McKay's bookstore used bookstore and I find a couple of good ones so I said I know what you want how did you know because I know you that's what you want yeah that's what I want so everybody likes to take gifts little small things don't cost a lot but a little something for for your family and loved ones well Jesus loves gifts too and he has a gift plan for you and he has a gift plan for your loved ones. And when in the resurrection morning, what he wants to do the most is to, to reunite families again. Oh, that, that's... You know how much God loves to reunite families? There are so many beautiful stories of God reuniting families after the Second World War, after other wars, they're separated. They don't know where they're at. And, and God reunites families. There's a lot of beautiful stories we could tell about that. And it makes me cry every time because I travel a lot without my family. Well, one day, uh, one day Jesus will have his bride with him and he's not going to go anywhere without her. They're going to follow the lamb everywhere he goes. Throughout eternity, everywhere the husband goes, the bride will be sure to follow. Isn't that beautiful? He, he, he wants to live with his family too. But he wants his family reunited and we're his family. God has family in other churches he has family in other denominations he has family in, in, in other religions I would say that we don't even know anything about and God wants to reunite his family and as times get hard we're going to press together have you, have you noticed that some ministries say well I can't work with that ministry or we don't work with that ministry have, have you noticed that huh? like uh, we can't go to that church or we can't go to that ministry or we can't invite him or we can't invite her. No, we don't want them here. But have you heard about them? I was in, in the union committee and for years I worked for the union department director for three unions. And when I was in Venezuela, there was a, a, a ministry and uh, the belonging to, to, the, to the current president of Heartland, his family, but, but they were off limits. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. So, so I told the union, I said, why don't we go visit them someday? Oh, no. How can we go and visit them? Have you heard what they have done? I, I don't think they're attacking the church. I said, I think they probably got sidelined along the way a disagreement. But if we're going to be neighbors in heaven, can't we be neighbors on earth? Amen. And they said, but you just don't know what they've done. I said, maybe I don't. But... I got a feeling that we probably messed up sometimes too. Anyway, they never went. I tried and tried and tried and they never went to see, but they're not far away from the place. 
But this is going to disappear. This idea of, I can't work with them, I can't work with her, I can't work with him, that's going to disappear. Very soon, God's going to have one fold and one shepherd. Amen. And we're all going to be inside the same corral. Amen. And we're going to work together. Uh, Joel 2. Joel 2, and I'm going to finish this sermon with that, what, what God is planning on doing. We know that Joel 2 talks about the latter rain, right? You're familiar with... Um, you're familiar, but at the beginning of Joel, it's, it's talking about God's army. This is God's army. It says, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all of the inhabitants of the earth, of the land, tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh and it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning spread across the mountains, as a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever like, neither shall there any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and desolate as a wilderness behind. Yea, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen. They shall run. We're, we're, we're talking about the description. It's an army that is invincible. And it's going to do what it has to do. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people shall be much pained. And all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like a mighty man. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break ranks. Right now we don't have any ranks. One... One conference is different than another. One mission is different than another. One union is different than another. Some countries are going in this direction. Other countries are going in this direction. One ministry is this way. One ministry is that way. But these, this army that God is building will not break ranks. Amen. Neither shall one thrust another, but they shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon a sword, they shall not be wounded. And the more you read, the more you realize we're talking about the loud cry. God's last day army is going to work together. We're not going to break ranks. We're not going to thrust one another. We're not going to say, oh, I can't work with you. Have you heard what you have done? Have you heard what people have written about you? No, 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 no. In the very last, the difficulties and the trials are going to press us together. Amen. And God's children will all work as one army. That's coming very soon. So let me ask you, if that's going to happen very soon, don't you think we ought to behave that way now? Huh? So if you have another ministry that doesn't believe exactly like you do, but as far as you know, they work for God. As far as you can tell, they're godly people. Do you think we should work together? But what if you don't see it like I do? No, no, let, the God, let God see it. When I, I, I played in a band for many years. Um, some years ago, I found on the internet a... Uh, what do you call those things that those uh, things that pop up all of a sudden and they play in public and nobody knows they're going to play? I forgot what it's called. Flash. flash, a flash mob. That's what it is, a flash mob. And and I found one on the internet in Spain, and it only had about fifty views. Today it has about three million views. But I found it, and this is what happened. There was a guy that stood out in the middle of the plaza, and he had a he had a, a big bass, you know those big basses. You don't even know what melody, because they don't play melody, they play harmony. Deep bass. And people were just, a couple people were watching. Interesting, but, but they couldn't understand what, was, what he was playing. And then a little bit later, another guy walks up, a lady with a violin. Oh, now we have a melody with a deep bass. Oh, this is, oh, more people started watching. And then another one, and another one. They just kept showing up casually. Saxophone, trumpet, all the instruments, a cello. And pretty soon the thing started to grow, and all of a sudden a crowd started gathering. And then, casually, you wouldn't realize who he was. He walked up. And there was the orchestra director, and he started directing. And then more instruments, and more instruments. And then the crowd started coming. And you think, 
that you just saw everything. And it was a big crowd and everybody. They were playing the full, the full music with all of the company, man, all the parts. It was gorgeous. And then you thought you saw it all? Then he turned and he went, boom, and a choir started singing. All the bystanders that were just coming around, they were part of the choir. <laughs> and then they started singing and there was great joy. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And, of course, that's the, also the hymn of Europe, the European hymn. Anyway, so, so I said, that's what God's people are going to be like someday. One plane here by himself, one little ministry, one pilot flying an airplane over here, another mechanic over here, another doing evangelism, a church here, a congregation there, more things. But one of these days, everybody's going to have their eyes on the director. Amen. If you're looking at each other, you're going to, and shoving, you shouldn't have played that. You're going to mess up your part. Just keep your eyes on the director. Let the director, the orchestra director, Amen. run the show. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you watch how he pulls us all together. Even if you don't see things alike, that's okay. That's the director's problem. That's not our problem. Right? Keep your eyes on the director. Amen. And the angels will watch you, protect you, and maybe it'll be your turn to be pulled out of a hostile taxi instantly and you'll be standing next to your family protected by God's angels Amen. may that be our experience may it always be our experience and as we prepare for the second service may our hearts be drawn closer and closer to God and may we determine in our hearts we will not defile ourselves with the world's, world's food with the world's, world's entertainment with the world's um, uh, tricks and media and things that they offer but let us keep our eyes on God Thank you very much. God bless.